Stanford University. Look, um, I, was, I was going to start talking about supersymmetry today, which I will. In fact, I'm going to talk about supersymmetry today, but I wanted to go back over the motivations and um, just repeat some of the things I said, I don't remember if it was last time, I think it was, about divergences in quantum field theory, and in particular, the divergences which have to do with the renormalization of the masses of particles. I'm not sure I said it well, and I did want to go back over it and um, discuss it at a little more length, and then start talking about how supersymmetry repairs the damage of uh, some of these problems. I honestly cannot remember what I said last time. So if I say the same thing over again, too bad. <laughs> What's that? You'll play back the tape. OK. Um, of course, all particle physics, almost all particle physics, no, not all particle physics, but a lot of particle physics is dependent on computations of Feynman diagrams. And Feynman diagrams can stand or can uh, govern a number of things. They can, first of all, govern, meaning to say that you use them to calculate scattering processes. Particles come in, particles go out, and you want to calculate the probability. So that's one thing that Feynman diagrams do very efficiently, and you have to sum up all Feynman diagrams that go into the calculation. Another thing that Feynman diagrams do is, or right, let me give you the precise words. The precise words is they help you calculate the effective Lagrangian. Now what is an effective Lagrangian? As opposed to an ineffect ineffective Lagrangian? No, that's not quite the right idea. When one speaks about an effective Lagrangian, this is not um, a, uh, uh, a description of approval for this particular Lagrangian. You know, it's very effective. No, that's not what you mean. Uh, what you mean is it's an approximate Lagrangian, an approximation to the exact thing, which is effective at um, removing a lot of the complexity which was too complicated to calculate. An effective Lagrangian typically involves a cutoff. In other words, a smallest distance or a largest momentum. Let me say something about Feynman diagrams that I haven't emphasized. We did discuss propagators. And I'm going to come back to them in a moment. But propagators are, if you like, the amplitude for putting in a particle at one place and taking it out in another place. They're functions of relative coordinates. They're functions of a thing that I think we called delta, if I remember. I'm not sure I do remember. But delta just stands for the difference of these two positions. And delta is a four vector, of course, so it has indices delta mu. Uh, the propagator is a function of the separation between the points. Okay. It can also be Fourier transformed. It can be Fourier transformed and expressed in terms of a function of four other variables, the Fourier conjugate variables. What are they called? What's the real name for the Fourier conjugates to, to positions? Momentum. Momentum. Right. So the propagator can all, and usually the Feynman, uh, Feynman rules are expressed in terms of momentum. But I'm not going to do that. It's a little more complicated. You have to worry about momentum conservation and all that sort of thing. Uh, but the other way to describe Feynman diagrams is in momentum space. And in momentum space, Feynman diagrams become integrals over momentum. For example, in a Feynman diagram like this, well, let's take a simpler one. Let's take a simpler one, much simpler, with only 
Well, let's start with the very simplest Feynman diagram I can imagine, just a closed loop with no particles coming in and no particles going out. That, if you like, can be thought of as a propagator connecting a point with itself. Okay. Um, we, can we can describe it two ways. We can describe it exactly that, as a propagator going from one point to the same point, or we can describe it as an integral, or a sum, or an integral over all the momenta that can flow around inside this closed loop. We can think of this now. Uh, Feynman diagrams are always sums over everything that can happen. So we can think of it just as a particle going from one place to another. That's one thing that can happen. Or we can think of it a different way. We can think of it as a particle going around this closed loop of momentum k. And then the propagator has some form in terms of momentum space, but the important thing is that the diagram becomes an integral over momentum space an integral over momenta, and there are low momenta, there are intermediate momenta, there are very high momenta, and the divergences that we're talking about can either be thought of as infinities which occur because the two points in this propagator are at exactly the same point, in other words, they're short distance, small distance infinities, the fact that the propagator becomes very, very large when the two points are close together. Or we can think of it as divergences which happen because there's just too much momentum space to integrate over. In other words, divergences which happen at very, very large momentum. What's the connection between large momentum and small distances? Well, that connection is an old connection that we know about. It's just the fact that momentum is related to inverse wavelength, and large momentum is associated with very small wavelength. That's all. So we can either describe things in k space or in x space. This delta here is really a delta x. It's a difference of two x's. So we could describe the propagator in, momentum, uh, in position space, or we can describe it in momentum space. If you like, sometime in the future, I'll tell you how Feynman diagrams are described in terms of momentum space for tonight. Uh, and since I can't remember if we did this before, well, I will possibly repeat. But nevertheless, the lesson is a good one and one worth learning. Uh, the question is, what is the propagator between two points for various kinds of particles? Now, basically, there are two kinds of particles in, well, actually, three kinds of particles in particle physics. There are particles of spin zero, not too many of them. Only one uh, that uh, really comes up in the phenomenology of particle physics, and it's the higgly wiggly boson, the Higgs boson. But it's there, it does exist, or at least I hope it exists. If it doesn't exist, uh, we all. Uh, uh, we're in trouble. So, yes, we do think there are scalar particles. That's one kind of particle. And the scalar particles, what does it mean that it's a scalar particle? First of all, it means that it spins zero. And second of all, it means that the field operator for it is a scalar. Only one component. No multiple components. And the propagator then, which, let me write down what the expression for the propagator for a scalar field is, not the numerical expression, but the quantity that we're talking about. You start by putting in at one point, let's call this x and let's call this y, and the, uh, x and y are both four vectors, and delta is the difference between them, so if you like, it's the distance y minus x, that's what delta is. Um, is that space or space time? Uh, space-time. And x and y can be arbitrary points of space-time separated by distance delta. Then the definition of the propagator is you start with a vacuum, you create a particle at point x. How do you do that? You do it by applying the field operator at point x. And then 
you take the inner product of that with the state that you have exactly the same kind of thing where you create a particle at y, phi of y. In other words, it's the, it's the amplitude that if you put in a particle at x, you will take out a particle or you will discover a particle at y. It's the inner product between these things. And let's write that down. The quantum mechanical inner product, phi of y, o. So on the one hand, you can think of it as an amplitude for a signal to go from x to y, if you like. But it also happens to be another thing. It's the, it's the expectation value of the product of the field phi of x and phi of y in the vacuum state. So it's both of these things. Whatever it is, it is a, uh, it is a function of x minus y, and it is the, the, the thing that we call a propagator. OK. Now, that's its definition. Uh, what is its value? That depends, of course, with I'm, here I'm writing this down for a scalar particle, phi. You do the same kind of thing if the particle is a fermion of spin a half. Let's just write it over here. If the particle were a fermion of spin a half, then it's described by a Dirac wave function or a Dirac field, psi. Psi has some components now. How many components does a fermion field have? Four. Four. Four complex components. All right. Now, if it's a massless fermion, it can have only two. But let's not uh, get into that right now. This is, uh, you can have separate left-handed and right-handed uh, fermions, in which case it is allowed to be two, a two-component thing. But that's not the important thing. It has some components, and it also depends on position. And so, for a for a fermion going from x to y, the corresponding thing would be the vacuum expectation value, or this is called the vacuum expectation value, or the propagator from x to y of, it could be, for example, psi dagger of x times psi of y. You put in a part, or you put in a particle at x, you take it out at y, and it also has some components. It has some non-trivial index structure. The index structure is the indices of the fermion field, the spinner indices of the fermion field, the spin indices, the one through four, not associated with the components of space, but the, the components of spinners. And so whatever it is, it's a function which depends on two positions and also two indices. Okay. I and J. I and J. Of course, you could also study the I-I component, but, uh, but in general, it's a matrix in the I-J space and also a function of separation. Now, we're going to suppress the, uh, the issue of the matrix structure of it. In other words, the I-J structure. We're going to suppress it. I'm going to finesse it and just avoid it in the discussion. It's a little bit complicated, not terribly. Um, but uh, go over the one to four, one to four of the Dirac, the four by four Dirac matrices, right? Since this is a matrix, a four by four matrix, it could be expanded in Dirac matrices if you liked. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. It could be. It depends. Um, it depends on whether the scalar particle is charged or not. If the scalar particle does not have any charge, then you don't have to put the dagger there. The dagger, then the field is real. Then the field is real. It consists of both creation and annihilation operators for the same kind of particle. So for a neutral particle like the Higgs boson, you wouldn't have to put a dagger there. For the electron, for example, the electron is charged, and so there's a difference between psi and psi dagger. But this is not the, uh, the uh, important uh, thing at the moment. Now the question is, what kind of function of delta is this propagator? And that can be figured out just on, well, OK, let's begin with massless particles. For massless particles, 
where there is no other scale in the problem, no scale in the problem other than the distance between these two points, that's the only length scale. Incidentally, mass is inverse length. Once we set h bar equal to 1 and c equal to 1, a mass is an inverse length. So when you specify a mass, you're also specifying a length scale. But if we're talking about massless particles, then there is no length scale in this problem other than the distance between x and y. Okay, That's the only length scale in the problem. Uh, so dimensional analysis alone is pretty much enough to tell us the form of this, of this quantity. Once there's a mass for the, Fermi, or for the particle, then the answer is a little more complicated and can't be completely guessed by, uh, by dimensional analysis. But let's start with the massless case. With the massless case, all we have to do is figure out what the dimensions of phi and psi are. And the way to do that is one basic rule the basic rule is the action is always dimensionless. Now, what's the units of action normally? The units of action normally are the units of action. In fact, they're the same as the units of h bar. But if h bar is set equal to 1, it means that actions are dimensionless. So action, the only, the only things we're interested in is the lengths, lengths or, or masses, lengths, times, and masses. If c is equal to 1, then lengths and time have the same units. Length and time has the same units. And mass or energy or momentum has units of inverse length. That's the way you keep track of dimensions. Uh, so let's try to figure out what the dimensions of phi and psi are. We start with the action for phi. All right, so a simple action, a simple expression for the action of a scalar field. We've done this before. Integral d4x, that means integral over space and time, of a Lagrange density. And the simple Lagrange density for a scalar field is, for example, just derivative of phi with respect to x mu squared, where squared means the, uh, the appropriate uh, contraction with the metric and so forth. But as far as units go, it's just derivative of phi with respect to x, integral d fourth x, and this is supposed to be dimensionless. So let's calculate the dimensions of phi. Here we have four powers of length. How many powers of length downstairs? Down, two. Two. Derivative of phi with respect to x has a length downstairs. So this whole thing has whatever the units of phi are, whatever they are, Let's call those units bracket phi. We have them twice. So we have the, bracket, the square of the dimension of whatever phi is divided by a length squared. Divided by a length, oh, sorry, times a length squared. Here, times a length squared. Length to the fourth divided by length squared. Times length squared. Just dimensionally not keeping track of anything except dimensions, this quantity has units of length squared times whatever the dimension of phi is squared. However, actions are supposed to be dimensionless. If the action is dimensionless, the only conclusion is that a scalar field like phi has units of inverse length. All right, so the dimension of phi is inverse length. Phi the dimension of phi is equal to length to the minus 1. Let's just check. Let's just go a little bit further and add another term to the Lagrangian. Let's add in minus m squared over 2, our friend the mass term, times phi squared. And let's see if it's still dimensionally consistent. Okay? Phi still has dimensions of length to the minus 1. All right? So phi squared is... What about m? What about a mass? Now, a mass is like a momentum or an energy, and it has units of inverse length. Mass has units of inverse length, just as momentum does. Okay. So this has units of inverse length squared, just like 
Derivatives with respect to x give you an inverse length squared. This is inverse length squared. Another inverse length squared. This is inverse length to the fourth times length to the fourth. So it still works out. Okay? It still works out that, ma in other words, the mass correctly has dimensions of inverse length. We first used the kinetic term in the Lagrangian to tell us what the dimensions of phi are, and then we could go and check that the dimensions of mass are <laughs> dimensions of mass. Supposing we added another term here, let's say lambda phi to the fourth. What would be the dimensions of lambda? Okay, let's check. Phi has units of inverse length, so phi to the fourth has inverse length to the fourth times length to the fourth. That's dimensionless, so what has to be the dimensions of lambda? Dimensionless, right? Dimensionless. So a phi to the fourth coupling constant is dimensionless. Carries no dimensions at all. That makes it kind of special, actually. Uh, but, uh, and if you went to phi to the sixth and so forth, or phi, you, could, you could tell me what the dimensions are by the same kind of rule. All right, let's suppose now that the mass of the field is zero, in which case there is no length scale in the problem other than delta. Then what must be the propagator phi of x, phi of y? On dimensional grounds, it has to be an inverse length squared. Two phi's, each one an inverse length. It can only depend on the distance between x and y. That's the uniformity of space, or translation invariance. Okay? So it has to be translation invariant, which means it only depends on x minus y. It has to be Lorentz invariant. It should be the same if we rotated uh, Lorentz frames. That means it can only depend on the proper distance between x and y. In other words, the proper size, the proper length of the interval delta. Nothing left for it to be except 1 over delta squared, where, let me just say what delta squared means. Delta squared means delta mu, delta mu. In other words, the four vector interval between x and y. That's all, that's the only thing. Now, when I say the only thing, of course, there could be a numerical constant, and there is a numerical constant. There's some pi's floating around. But, and you can't get the pi's from dimensional analysis. You can get them pretty easily, but not the, from dimensional analysis. So apart from numerical numbers of order one, things like pi, maybe a two here and there, there's probably a four pi in it to be exact, the answer is going to be one over delta squared. Now what happens when there's a mass? A mass? When, you, when there's a mass in a problem, here's the logic. Um, the propagator, at, as a general rule, things at very, very large momentum forget the fact that a particle might have mass. Let me give you an example. The energy of a particle of momentum p. The energy of a particle of momentum p is the square root of p squared plus m squared. Right? That's the energy of a particle of momentum p. What happens? Uh, if I wanted to put speeds of light in there, I would stick a c, uh, a c squared and a c to the fourth, but let's forget that. c is equal to 1. What's the energy of a massless particle? The energy of a massless particle is just E is equal to the absolute value of P. What happens to this expression when P gets very large? When P gets enormously large, much, much larger than M, it becomes a good approximation just to say that it's the absolute value of p. So here's an example of how uh, a particular formula forgets the fact that there's a mass when the momentum gets very, very large. Large momentum typically means very short distance, short wavelength. So it's a general rule that things like propagators uh, become insensitive to the mass at very, very small distances. They're dominated by very high momenta. In other words, when you think about the propagator or the Fourier transform of the propagator, uh, 
It's a function of momentum. And the very, very high momentum value of that propagator forgets the fact that there's a mass, but the high momentum value of the propagator is intimately connected with the short distance behavior of the propagator. So at very short distances, we expect that this is correct even if there is a mass. 1 over delta squared is the way the propagator behaves even if there is a mass in the problem. Now what if there is a mass? How is it corrected? It's corrected by things which can be important at large distances. Let's just draw a, uh, a let's just graph this function. We graph the function and it blows up at small distances and then falls off like 1 over delta squared, smoothly. If the particle has a mass, then the result is that the propagator falls off when delta becomes bigger than 1 over m. 1 over m is the Compton wavelength of the particle, inverse of a mass. When delta gets larger than the, uh, than the inverse mass of the particle, the particle just has a harder time uh, propagating from one point to another when it's massive. When it's light, it can propagate a long way. When it's massive, it, it can't propagate so easily a long way. That goes back to the reason why forces mediated by massless particles are longer range than forces mediated by massive particles. So the typical kind of thing that happens, approximately, this is not an exact statement, is that you get some sort of thing like e to the minus delta times m, which gets small when delta is bigger than 1 over m. This is the kind of correction that comes from a mass. When delta is very small, this is not very significant. This is just 1 when delta is very small. But when, m, when delta is large, this just gets cut off. Now, if we really want it to be precise, it doesn't really quite look exactly like this. This 1 over delta squared is not exactly 1 over delta squared. It's a little bit smaller than 1 over delta squared. In fact, it's a little bit smaller at every value of delta. So if we really were to plot it carefully, to plot the massless and the massive propagator, we would always find that the massive propagator was a little bit smaller. Here's the massless propagator. It goes off to uh, uh, smoothly down here. The, massless, the massive propagator would be a little bit smaller. So I can't, it's hard for me to draw this, but it would be a little bit smaller at all values of distance. So that's one fact. It would, they would have the same asymptotic behavior near delta equals 0, 1 over delta squared, but the massive one would always be a little bit smaller. The propagator would always be a little bit less potent, so to speak. OK, so that's the massless propagator. Sorry, that's the, um, the scalar propagator. And I think we did talk about this, now I'm beginning to recall. We talked about a Feynman diagram which looks like this. This is one of the simplest Feynman diagrams you can draw. It represents, if you like, a correction. This could be a scalar particle. Let's think about a scalar particle. All right, this is a correction. This would be a correction coming from lambda phi to the fourth. Here's a vertex involving four particles, two in and two out, or one, two, three, four. And this would have weight lambda times the propagator from one point back to the same point. Now this is actually a correction to the mass term of the scalar field, the m squared phi squared. The m squared phi squared represents a diagram where a particle comes in and goes back out. You absorb one and re-emit it, and it has a coefficient or a strength m squared, or m squared over 2, that's not important. This is a correction to that. It corrects the amplitude for a particle to come in and, and just go back out from a point. How big is that correction? It's just given by the Feynman diagram, and the Feynman diagram is lambda times the propagator for delta equals zero. Okay. So the answer is crazy. The answer for this process here is delta divided by 
zero squared, no, sorry, lambda divided by zero squared or delta squared, and it's infinite. It's bad, it's infinite. Now, we can't trust our theories to arbitrarily small distances. Presumably, we expect that there's some kind of fuzziness in nature at very small distances. We know very little about it. Gravity might create it. Something else beyond what we actually know might create a degree of fuzziness. And if the fuzziness is on a scale, let's call it small delta, let's write that big delta is always bigger than small delta. Why? Small delta is the smallest possible uh, distances in our uh, imagination. Very likely the Planck scale or maybe some unification scale. Very likely a very large energy scale. Ma oh, sorry, a very large momentum scale, a very, very small distance scale. Then this O squared, this zero squared, would be replaced by delta squared. Of course, if delta is much smaller than the experimentally accessible things that we know about, and lambda is not horribly small itself, which it's not expected to be, for example, for the Higgs boson, then this is going to be a big thing and typically bigger than the starting mass. So this is the problem. The problem is you start with something which you imagine is relatively small. Small on what scale? Small on the scale of the cutoff. And then you get a correction which is far bigger than the thing that you, uh, that you wanted to get out in the end. All right, so that's the problem, as we've discussed, of fine tuning. And another way to think about this infinity is to think about the prop or the Feynman diagram as being an integral over the momenta that can circulate in the loop here. You're just getting too much juice from very high momentum particles flowing around in the loop. So you can either think of a cutoff at small distances or you can think of a maximum momentum. It comes to the same thing. The diagram, this is called quadratically divergent, which means that as the cutoff scale goes to zero, it diverges as two powers of uh, one over delta. Okay, that's the, that's the, uh, the problem for the Higgs boson. Now, let's discuss the propagator for fermions. Oh, yeah, okay, let's uh, notice that at very small distances, this e to the minus delta m would not help you particularly. When delta is very, when capital delta is very small, this is just approximately one, and so it doesn't help you very much. It doesn't do anything for you. Uh, but now let's uh, think about fermions. Let's go on to fermions and discuss the Feynman diagrams for fermions. Similar pattern. The only difference is that the Lagrangian for fermions has a different structure. So let me write the Lagrangian for fermions. We've discussed it before for the Dirac equation. It's the Lagrangian governing the Dirac equation. It's actually psi bar integral d4x again, that's the action, integral d4x, psi bar, where psi bar is just basically the complex conjugate of psi, it's the complex conjugate of psi times one of the gamma matrices, gamma matrices, or one of the, um, one of the Dirac matrices, psi bar, and then there's a gamma mu. These are the gamma, these are the Dirac matrices. These are the four Dirac matrices. They're not important to this argument. And there is a derivative with respect to x mu psi. There's only one derivative. <coughs> The other index is soaked up by the Dirac matrices. Okay. This is the structure of it. We can also put in the m psi bar psi. Notice that it's not m squared here. It's just m. All right, let's check first from this term. Let's check what the dimensions of psi are. And then knowing the dimensions of psi, we can come back to this term and ask whether the m that appears here really has dimensions of mass. We could do it the other way also, but uh, let's do it from starting from here. All right, what is the dimension? The dimensions of an action are that it's dimensionless. This has to be dimensionless. So far, I don't know what the dimensions of psi are, so I'll just call them bracket psi. Uh, 
psi and psi star complex conjugate have the same dimensions. So there's no difference in dimensionality between psi and psi bar. So what do we have? We have two factors of psi, dimensions of psi squared, and now length to the fourth, gamma matrices are incidentally just numerical matrices, ones and zeros, so they don't have any dimensions at all. And then we have the derivative with respect to x. What about that? One inverse length. So that's just length cubed. So what is the dimension of psi? It's not the same as the dimension of a scalar field. In fact, it has dimension psi equals 1 over length to the 3 halves. Odd. Funny. Fractional. Ha fermions always have halves in them. Everything about fermions has half integers in it. In particular, the dimension of the fermion field is 1 over length to the 3 halves. It's a lot easier to do with the math term. With what? It's a lot easier to do with the other term. Yeah, it is. So let's do it. But, uh, yeah, I know, but I wanted to show that you get the same answer. Right. All right, so let's, let's check here. If psi has units of 1 over length to the 3 halves, how about psi star psi or psi dagger psi? That has units of 1 over length cubed. A mass has units of 1 over length. That's, one over, uh, that's altogether 1 over length to the fourth times length to the fourth. That's dimensionless. All right, so in particular, you notice that what goes here is not m squared. It's m, and it's true. It really is the mass. Okay, so psi has units of 1 over length to the 3 halves. How about the fermion propagator? Each one of the psi's has units of 1 over length to the 3 halves. And so what must the propagator be? For massless particles. Let's start with massless particles. This was 1 over delta squared. 1 over delta cubed. In other words, the third power of the proper distance between the two points. Now, this is, this is dimensional, dimensional argument. There are also Dirac matrices here. There are also Dirac indices. If I really wanted to write it correctly, all I would have to do would be to, let me write it with its, with its indices. You put the four-vector delta up here uh, with index mu. You put a gamma matrix also with index mu, and then you take the i jth component of the Dirac matrix. Let's do it differently. Let's put the index here downstairs, the index here upstairs. Doesn't matter how you do it. And i, j are the matrix entries of the Dirac matrix. Now, this is not quite right yet. This is not dimensionally consistent. I added an extra factor of delta upstairs, so I have to put an extra factor of delta downstairs. That's, in fact, what the Dirac propagator is for a massless particle. All right? But from our, for, for our purposes, we can just call this 1 over delta cubed. For dimensional reasoning, it's enough to know 1 over delta cubed. OK, so this is 1 over delta cubed. And when the mass term is included, Again, the propagator, this is a correct estimate of it for very small distances. At large distances, it's again corrected and suppressed by the mass term. So the propagator is always a little bit smaller than this, and the amount by which it's smaller depends on the mass. The bigger the mass is, the smaller the propagator in here. Okay? But at very small distances, it's essentially correct. So let's now ask about Feynman diagrams with fermions in them. In particular, I want to ask, is there something about a fermionic diagram that might cancel the bad thing that we discovered? Where is it? I erased it. The bad thing that we discovered about the self-energy diagram due to the boson. In other words, we started with this diagram. And we said that it was lambda divided by delta squared. 
In fact, although I didn't mention it, there are some, there are some numerical factors there. The numerical factors are computable as pi's and 4's and stuff like that. What about the sine? The sine is positive. The sine is positive, and it is connected with something that I think I mentioned last time, that closed loop diagrams involving bosons are positive. Closed loop diagrams involving fermions are typically negative. Excuse me, is, that, is there a, a sort of like a rotation then? Because we talked about the two or one revolution. You're asking about the sign? You're asking about the sign? The sign. Why? Well, OK. All right, so let me go back through the argument. I think I discussed this last time, but I don't remember. So I'll go back through the little argument. It's a pretty little argument. I'm not sure who it's due to. I didn't invent it. Uh, it might have been Feynman, I'm not sure. Uh, so it goes as follows. Supposing you want to know the sign of a closed loop diagram, it's either, it's either plus or minus. All of these diagrams, simple diagrams like this, are real. They're either positive or negative. All right, so start first with two loops. That's just the product of a one loop diagram, a diagram involving two closed loops. Just simple closed loops going, and they could be connected to other things, that's not important, but just two closed loops and ask what the sign of that is. Well, if the sign of a single closed loop is positive, then the product of two positives is positive. If the sign of a single closed loop is negative, the product of two negatives is a positive. So two loops side by side always corresponds to a positive amplitude. Now, next, let's cut open this diagram like that. And think about a diagram which is exactly the same as the original, except we switch the particles. Whenever you switch and interchange two bosons, it's a plus sign. That's, I'll tell you what it's related to. It's closely related to the fact that the wave function of two fermions, let's say psi, this is now an ordinary Schrodinger wave function, not a Dirac wave function. An ordinary Schrodinger wave function, let's call it S sub Schrodinger, just the, uh, the wave function of a two particle system, x1 and x2, is symmetric under interchange of x1 and x2. It is equal to psi Schrodinger of x2 and x1. In other words, if you just interchange the particles, you just get the same wave function back. And that's the plus sign here. Fermions are exactly the opposite. Fermions, this is also the Schrodinger uh, uh, wave function for two fermions. But for two fermions, you always get a minus sign. That's the anti-symmetry of the wave function of two fermions. And it also says that if you try to put two fermions into the same state, you will always get zero because if you have two fermions in the same state, that's a symmetric wave function, and the wave function for fermions must be antisymmetric. Right, so this minus sign recurs over and over. And it occurs in all sorts of contexts wherever when you interchange two fermions. You get back exactly the same thing, of course, but with a minus sign in the quantum mechanical wave function. All right, the implication of that is that if you were to take this diagram and switch the fermions, you would get a minus sign relative to a diagram without switching. Well, the diagram without switching was positive, just because it was the product of two equal things. Switch them, and the diagram must be negative for fermions. For bosons, switching them does nothing, and it will remain positive. Okay. But when you switch the particles like that, what do you make? You simply make a one-loop diagram instead of a two-loop diagram. You can now trace this around, and it really is just a one-loop uh, with a little bit of a twist in it. It's just a one-loop diagram. And so the net result is a one-loop diagram for fermions will have the opposite sign from a one-loop diagram for bosons. And this is very general. The one-loop diagram for bosons is positive. The one-loop diagram for fermions is typically negative. All right, as, a, as an example, there would be this diagram which is correcting the mass of the Higgs boson. This could be the Higgs boson, for example. 
Higgs boson. Right? It's positive, and it's lambda, where lambda is the quartic coupling here. Where is it? I think I've erased it in, from the Lagrangian. The quartic coupling times 1 over delta squared. Now, let's ask, supposing there was a fermion. Let's take a fermion now. Supposing there was a fermion which had the same mass, exactly the same mass as the boson here. You know what? I'm going to draw bosons with dotted lines. That's more or less conventional. The bosons, for some reason, are drawn with dotted lines and fermions with solid lines. Right? Is there a diagram that could possibly cancel this involving fermions? Okay. So let's draw a diagram, the simplest diagram we can, involve, we can write down in which the Higgs boson, whatever it is, emits two fermions. It can emit one fermion. You can't have a boson becoming one fermion. It must become an even number of fermions. So let's take the boson. It emits two fermions, and the two fermions come back together again. It looks quite different than this diagram. Okay. But let's estimate it. Let's estimate it by the same kind of uh, dimensional arguments. First of all, there's some coupling constant. Let's call that coupling constant G. There's another coupling constant G here. This coupling constant is not the same as lambda. In fact, it's the coupling which involves the boson times the product of two fermion fields. It's a, it's a, it's a term in the Lagrangian, psi, dagger, psi bar psi times phi. It's phi and psi bar psi, or if it's the Higgs boson, it would be the Higgs boson coupled to two fermions. The fermions could be quarks, they could be leptons, they could be whatever you like. Let's take the case, well, whatever they happen to be. We'll discuss what particles could be there in a moment, or maybe we'll get to it. Okay, I guess we won't, but uh, all right, how do we calculate this diagram? Well, first of all, this diagram involves two points. This diagram only involved one point. Now, strictly speaking, this point could have been anywhere in space. So strictly speaking, we really have an integral to do over all of space. But that integral is trivial. It just says that the process could happen anywhere in space. Let's pick a point uh, where the process happens, and then there's no integral left. It's particle absorbed at this point, emitted from that point. Now, here is more complicated. The particle is absorbed at one point and emitted from another point. Right? But if these points are very close together, it looks an awful lot like this. Okay? What do we do with this diagram? Well, we could, for example, hold the center, the average position fixed. Just as we hold the position here fixed and don't integrate it over all of space, we could hold the average position fixed. Or even better, we could just, even easier, we can hold one point fixed, but then we have to integrate or sum over all the places where the other point could be. So this would be the amplitude for a particle to be absorbed at a position and re-emitted from a nearby position. So we're eventually going to have to integrate over that point, or you can integrate over the separation between the points, holding the average position fixed. Either way, it doesn't matter. What is this going to give? Well, we know what the propagators are. The propagators are 1 over delta cubed. These are fermions now going in the loop. So each propagator is of the form 1 over delta cubed. There are two of them. 1 over delta cubed. So, as a Feynman diagram, this is going to be proportional to 1 divided by delta to the sixth. But wait, we still have to integrate, holding this point fixed, integrate over this point. That's an integral d4 delta. Integral d4 delta. What else did I leave out? I left out the coupling constants, g squared. And one more thing I left out. What's the last thing I left out? 
minus sign. It's a loop of fermions. It's a loop of fermions, so it gets a minus sign. Now, how big is this integral? Well, where do you integrate between? You integrate from very small distances, namely little delta, to infinity. This point could be far away, but it can't, it's not allowed to be closer than the cutoff distance. So this is an integral which goes from small distances delta to infinity for each one of the coordinates. How big is this integral? Well, one way to, 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 uh, to calculate it is, again, just use dimensional analysis. There's no length scale in this problem. It's an integral over lengths. So there's no length in the problem other than the thing that you're integrating over. Oh, and of course, the cutoff length. This integral has dimensions. Four powers of delta upstairs, six powers of delta downstairs. That means it has a dimension of one over length squared. And the only possible answer is one divided by little delta squared. So just on dimensional grounds alone, this is going to be minus g squared. What, uh, oh, th this is not literally an integral from, this is, there are four integrals here. There are four integrals here. You could say each one from delta to infinity. Four sign changes, if you like. So no sign change. Okay. For each component, yeah. You can imagine integrating each component of delta from some small distance to infinity. And uh, no, there's no sign. No, in fact, there's no sign change. But uh, the integrand is positive. Notice that the integrand is positive. There's no way that you can get anything but a positive answer times the minus sign. So this is going to be g squared over delta squared. What's the root of g? Ah. This g is dimensionless. OK, let's, all right, let's check that. Let's check that. Let's check the dimensions of g. What we've put here is g phi, that's the scalar field, times psi bar psi. That's two fermions and a boson, or a scalar boson at the same point. All right, let's check what the dimension of g has to be. This has units of 1 over length. This has units of 1 over length cubed. The product of these three has units of 1 over length to the fourth times d4x makes it dimensionless. So g here had better be dimensionless. Okay? Yukawa, this is a form of a Yukawa coupling, a coupling between the Higgs boson, for example, and two fermions. So these couplings are also dimensionless. G is also dimensionless. And the answer is, again, some kind of combination of coupling constants divided by delta squared times the minus sign. So we're going to get minus g squared over delta squared. Now, in a certain sense, it doesn't look like we've made much progress. We have. A number here times 1 over delta squared, at least we have it minimum, we have a potential source of a minus sign to cancel the plus sign. But you would think it would be an extraordinary miracle if nature chose to make g squared, this coupling constant, exactly equal to this coupling constant here. That would require something special. It would require some mathematical structure which would tell you some symmetry or some other mathematical reason to say, choose g squared equal to lambda. That's supersymmetry. That's exactly what's that's the sort of thing that supersymmetry does over and over again. It restricts the coupling constants to combinations. And it turns out that those combinations are exactly the right combinations to get rid of these nasty divergent integrals, or many of the nasty divergent integrals. Next time, we'll discuss supersymmetry itself, which is a symmetry principle, which is mathematically very potent. And it tells you such things as the masses of fermions must match exactly. And notice something interesting. Uh, the cancellation would be incomplete if the fermion and boson had different masses. Why? Because the propagators wouldn't be exactly the same. In that case, the, the, the cancellation would be incomplete. 
But as long as the propagators were sufficiently sim similar or sufficiently close to what I've written here at small distances, it would get rid of the infinity. So if the fermion and boson didn't have the same masses, slightly different, they, what might have canceled wouldn't exactly cancel. But the divergent part of it would cancel. So that's the kind of thing that supersymmetry or approximate supersymmetry does. We'll discuss next time the a little bit about the mathematics of supersymmetry. It's a very, very um, abstract kind of thing. And I will show you some examples of how supersymmetry operates to always um, take care of these nasty fine-tuning problems. All right, let's, uh, let's go to the, uh, to the Hofstadter lecture. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.